There was once a teeny tiny water molecule. That molecule was old, very old, perhaps even as old as four and a half billion years old. That molecule is likely still around today, hidden somewhere on the blue planet, or as we call it, Earth. It has likely traveled the equivalent of thousands, if not millions of miles. We live on a beautiful planet covered in billions upon billions of tiny water molecules, just like this one. A planet full of life and diversity, and it just so turns out that water is essential for all of that life. Every single organism on Earth needs water to survive. This means that our little water molecule could be hiding somewhere in this squirrel, or this hibiscus flower, or in this fungi colony, or this slug, or even in our own body. But water can also be found in many different places on Earth, like this river me and my friends swimming during summer, or this man-made lake close to my childhood home that used to be a limestone mine. But most notably, water can be found in the oceans, which cover over 70% of the surface of the Earth. The ocean is home to many distinct marine ecosystems, like salt marshes, estuaries, intertidal ecosystems, deep sea ecosystems, and of course, the very charismatic coral reef ecosystem, all of which are incredibly important for the health of our planet. The ocean plays a huge role in carbon storage. About a third of the carbon we, as humans, release in the atmosphere is stored in the ocean. The ocean also produces a significant amount of oxygen for our atmosphere thanks to the photosynthetic bacteria and algae like the cyanobacteria. Coral reefs are incredibly diverse and productive ecosystems, home to many ecological processes and interactions. The coral themselves are a classic example of ecological interactions, more specifically, a symbiotic or mutualistic relationship between two organisms. The relationship between the cnidarian polyp and the zooanthellae benefit both individuals. Each provides resources for the other. The zooanthellae will provide nutrients to the polyp as a byproduct of photosynthesis and will feed on the polyp's waste. In return, the polyp's hard calcareous shell will offer protection to the zooanthellae. Both individuals depend on each other, but that relationship can quickly fall apart. The temperature of the water needs to be within a certain range of roughly 18 to 28 degrees Celsius. If the temperature rises above that, the polyp can expel the zooanthellae, which may result in an event called coral bleaching, where a colony of coral in which all the zooanthellae have been expelled becomes white. Coral reefs also host many more interactions and trophic cascades, from predators to detritophores. The sea urchin is another classic example in ecology. Sea urchins are a keystone species. They are incredibly important to the coral reef ecosystem. Any disruption in their population can lead to huge impacts on the ecosystem through a process called top-down control. Top predators regulate the herbivores, or grazers, such as the sea urchin, by preying on them and reducing their numbers. The sea urchin will in turn regulate the abundance of algae by grazing on them. A decrease in predatory fish can lead to outbreaks in sea urchin populations, which can cause the whole ecosystem to become urchin barren after all the algae has been grazed. In the past, Human activity has often been the cause of such disturbance. Humans, time and time again, have led to the destruction of many habitats, which is why the implementation of practices such as two-eyed seeing becomes increasingly important. Looking at things from a Western perspective, as well as an indigenous perspective, could be the key to protecting ecosystems. This is what the sound of water under the surface reminds me of all the life and intricate connections between organisms, all the processes happening right below the surface of every ocean, but more notably, 
in some of the most beautiful ecosystems on Earth, the coral reefs.